Can you all hear me? It's Tonya, is this all right? It's still coming through, brilliant. Okay, um, as Max said, and Tonya gave me a kind introduction, I'm the director at Bartram Trees, which is uh, based in Ely in Cambridgeshire. And we ship something like 80,000 standard trees out into the primarily urban environment annually. And Mac mentioned Amy or Kia as they are now. Uh, they've been buying trees from us for the last five, six years. So when you're going out finding these trees that are not surviving, I hope you will recall it's nothing to do with the nursery. Uh, but anyway, an aside. I'm also a co-founder of a group called Tree Economics that's very much engaged with measuring environmental services that trees provide and creating values for the asset uh, that trees actually are. I'm also a trustee of the Trees and Design Action Group and um, a trustee of the Arboricultural Association. So that's the introduction. And when Mac asked me to do this, I first of all said, yeah, it's really short notice. Now I thought, okay, what's the best approach to do it, having agreed? And I thought the easiest thing in the world would be to just come up and put, start talking species. And I decided against that. And having listened to Callum and Mac this morning, I'm glad I've chosen the route I've chosen. So hopefully it will be helpful to you interesting and stimulate some thinking so what have we got um callum's already mentioned the benefits tre of trees here's those benefits represented graphically and you can see you have timber reduced stress and well-being and i'm sure as being tree enthusiasts you will have a fair knowledge intuitively as to the benefits of trees and what they actually contribute, particularly in the urban environment. So here's the problem, and the problem is that you've got the urban forest generally, and we're talking about trees in the urban areas, is that we have a dwindling resource. And it's a resource that is dynamic, it changes over time, trees die, and trees need to be planted, which is the subject of today. You can also see the percentage of the population that are going to be living in towns and cities. And the one in the middle is really, I still find staggering, having been involved in this for 25, 30 years, that 60, 67% of the urban forests in the UK have no proactive management. So what Mac has described and what Callum has described is actually really encouraging and really good because it talks about what are we planting where are we planting it and really importantly what are we how are we maintaining it so one of the solutions to that dynamism of the urban forest is that trees need to be replaced. And this is a picture of Barcham Nursery, that's Pyrus Calariana Chanticleer, which I'm sure you have planted in Birmingham. And that gives you an idea of the scale and size of the nursery. That's one species, one uh, tree type. So there'd be very little replacement in the urban areas through natural regeneration. Most will be delivered through human agency, that's us, we'll be planting them. And we'll be planting them in environments that were the tree to be given a choice, it'd say, no, thank you, I really don't want to grow there. Um, just a little on the side, when making tree selection and you're thinking about your tree population and its resilience to pest and disease, pest and disease has been mentioned. Yes, it is a real problem at this moment in time and it's a growing problem. Bear in mind that Pyrus shan't clear is a clonal selection. Every one of those Chanticleer you're looking at is genetically identical. If there's a pest and disease that comes in that actually really quite likes the taste of Pyrus Chanticleer, they will all go. So I'm not saying don't use it, but just be aware when you're building up your diversity of your tree population, that resilience against pest and disease is really very important. So looking here, 
So then how do we maximize the benefits from tree planting? And the argument is that those trees, the planting has to be strategized. And we have all sorts of planting initiatives that are common to me, all of which are very commendable. So at no point in this am I going to be knocking or being critical. It's just that very few planting initiatives tend to take place against an overall vision. What are we trying to achieve? Where do we want to be? What gains do we want to have? What ecosystem services do we want to deliver? And then there's the targets and goals. Where do we want to be? And you've heard the target this morning, 4 million trees in the next 15 years. And an action plan, where to plant, what to plant, how to plant, and there's that management and maintenance. And this is where I particularly like the work that Mac has shown to you, monitoring and review. You can get the first part of it right and do the planting and give yourselves a pat on the back. But if those trees actually don't last more than three, four years through maintenance, then what have we achieved? So some guidance, some things you might want to look at. And if you have problems, for instance, this is BS8 of 545. This was published in 2014. It's a British standard called From Nursery to Independence in the Landscape, published in 2014. Uh, I know this is being recorded, but BSI is a racket. Um, they get other people to do the work and then charge the punter extraordinary amounts of money to get the information. So I'm sure if you approach Mac, who will take a devious route to me, and if anybody's interested, I'm sure that information can be supplied. But the British Standard broke it down into policy and strategy, site evaluation assessment, species selection and procurement, nursery production, planting and maintenance, and then review. They're very similar to the criteria that Mac outlined. They're not, but they're the strands that actually link and uh, guide us towards successful tree planting and it's like a chain if any one of those elements within the chain breaks down then the whole chain becomes likely to be subjected to failure so here's the process so policy and strategy and they can all the notes from washington dc nursery production what type of trees we're doing and actually i would encourage callum if you could put a size element within your framework, within your website, which I thought was great. Um, I think that would be very informative and useful to know actually what size you're planting. And if you then choose to calculate ecosystem service delivery, you'll have a more sort of astute measure of where you're going to be. And it will also guide you in terms of if you set ecosystem service targets, you'll be able to put the size of tree in the framework, which will guide you to when you are likely to achieve those targets. So transportation, storage, planting, maintenance, and this one, um, independence, that's the Aldwych in London. Those trees were planted in 1946. It's taken the time from 1946 when they were this size to reach this size when they're delivering benefits. So that's the time span we're talking about with 70, 80 years from there to there. Can you all see my cursor, by the way? Okay, so that's the time scale. And that's what we're talking about when we're thinking about longevity in the landscape. So each of the components come up with form a tree planting strategy. So what I'd like to do is just have a little look at each of those. So the vision, this is a shot from France and you can see there, that's, I forget the name of the place, but you can see the buildings, the design, it's linked to the landscape. It's part of the landscape. It wasn't separate to it, but somebody at some time had a vision for that place, what it would look like, where it would sit, how it would be constructed, how it would blend with the landscape. And very often when we're considering our urban environments, 
that landscape is missing. The left hand photograph is a place called Breve in France. Those are standard London Plain, but you can see how the London Plain has been used. And this is an archway that will be formed around the Ring Road in Breve in France. This is, believe it or not, is central London. But these trees, if you look at these London Plain here, when they were developing, they were pruned in a slightly different way. You'll see many lower branches are left, were left on the tree, which equates to where they arrived from nursery. These were pruned higher. And you can see the arching effect you've got over that. It's behind the Tate Gallery in London. This is a park in central London, where I started working in 1970-something odd. This photograph was taken recently. Those lime trees haven't moved since I worked in that park. They haven't grown. They've turned over each year, but they haven't grown. This is the uh, Memorial Gardens in Chicago, Avenue of Trees, and you can see the landscape. And this is an extreme shot taken in Italy, but there's sort of um, green coverage and ecosystems probably taken to the extreme. But with all of those, there's a vision. Somebody's had a thought. Somebody said, this is what we want to achieve. This is the end game. So I'm not going to read all this stuff out, but so in the vision, what can you include? include increasing canopy cover, stormwater interception, impact of heat highland effect. All of these are services that trees provide. But within your structure, within your vision, what do you want your tree planting to do? And it may what it may do all of those. It may do some of it. May be you're planting in an area where pollution is your greatest problem. In which case, select species that will actually deal with the pollution most effectively. So this all links into species choice. And this is where I get really upset. So if I start swearing, I apologize. The setting of targets, we get swallowed up into political capital. So we get some of these um, rather commendable and very meritable targets but ambitious targets from bristol to double the city's canopy cover by 2050 it is impossible through tree planting it is impossible because the trees have to grow and you're still having trees that are dying just on natural turnover so 22,000 large trees, 28,000 small trees will be planted in urban areas from Thanet to Middlesbrough. Okay, it's fine, but there isn't any reality to the, to the target that's been set. It's a, it's a numbers game. This is, from the government's point, this is the important thing, the number, not where the trees are going or what they're actually going to achieve or what services they're going to deliver, providing we plant 22,000 trees with successful. There isn't ever any mention of whether the trees survive. And increase canopy cover in London by 10% by 2050. It's impossible. The canopy cover of London is around 22% now. So the suggestion is we're going to increase it to 25, 26% by 2050. Each London borough will lose the equivalent of two to 300 trees each year, just by natural turnover. So you can see where I'm going, so apologies for that. This ambitious targets and goals, and we've seen these all over the place. This is from Chicago, and the, the drawing you will see there shows this wonderful tree-lined avenue. You've got the pedestrians enjoying the canopy cover and the new building, and it's 199 trees. I saw the tree planting plits they were going into, and I saw the trees planted that were planted, and I would suggest there is a, isn't a cat in hell's chance of that vision actually actually being actualized. There's the vision. They'll be planted, and then they'll be forgotten. So questions to have asked, how many of those targets are achievable? How many commitments are made without a detailed knowledge? Because if you're going to make a target, the starting point is, 
what have you got now? You have to understand what you've got before you actually can build on it. So for instance, if you have a population that's overstocked with sycamore, which you can, then your population is vulnerable because you're, high, you're highly dependent on sycamore. So how do you correct that in your species choice? How do you increase diversity so your population is not vulnerable? And this idea of a central vision, you're all going to get these slides anyway, so I'm not going to read every line because it would be a waste of your time and uh, I can see you dozing off, or I can hear you dozing off already. So it's knee-jerk reactions. There has to be some sort of strategy underpinning all of this if we're to make the most from urban forest development. Incorporating green infrastructure into community forest uh, in, uh, uh, urban forestry canopy cover, canopy goals. Here's some examples. Melbourne, this is their canopy cover target. The wonderful thing I noticed about Melbourne in Melbourne was they actually have an internal audit of their, or an external audit of all the trees three years after tree planting. Any that don't actually arrive or deliver in the standard that was expected are then rejected and not adopted by Melbourne City Council and the contractor and nursery retain liability for those trees unless they're actually have they met the standards for. And here's Seattle's Urban Forest, a tree strategy document. I think Mac may correct me, but I think it's still as little as 52% of the local authorities within this country actually have any sort of written tree strategy at all. So there's a randomness to it. Here's some work that uh, Tree Economics did in the London Borough of Ealing. And you will see total number of trees measured, tree canopy cover, most common species. And here's where you start to build up and actually understand the value of the asset. So here's the replacement cost of those 40,000 trees, if it were possible, 65 million. So if we equate it to Birmingham, and I'm sure Mac has the numbers, there is a tree officer who is undervalued, probably seven ranks down the hierarchy, who's probably managing the most valuable asset the local authority has, because there's actually the capital value of it. And then you start to look at what services those trees are delivering. So six tons of pollution removed, 16 tons of carbon stored, 446 tons of carbon uh, sequestered annually, uh, nearly 13,000 cubic meters of stormwater runoff of Viva. Annual benefits. So those trees that actually have an asset value there are actually delivering annually that amount in terms of benefits. What does that mean? Well, those benefits accrue and uh, are enlarged every year as the tree population grows. Here's some just figures from Ealing, and I say you're all getting this, so uh, please look at that thoroughly, have a look at it. Here's the bit about the warehouse. This is Amazon, you may have noticed, or it might not be Amazon, but anyway, it's, it's an Amazon equivalent. Can you tell me that Amazon would be able to manage their shed without knowing exactly what they've got. So how can we manage a tree population without understanding and knowing exactly what we've got? And then we can plan what we need and then how we get there. So it's this planning stage, understanding what it is you've got. Where to plant? Several questions. Where are you going to maximise the benefits? What's the planting space available? What's the total stocking? We don't use total stocking in this area. Somebody earlier said we might not just have the space. Well, if we haven't, then we've reached 100% stocking for that area. But we don't know what the total stocking area is for our community. So your Greater Manchester area, what's the total stocking area? What's the maximum number of trees you can actually achieve? I'm guessing the answer won't be there because I don't know of anywhere in the UK where total stocking 
is actually considered part of the metrics that you use to plan your urban forest. I so I'll go back there because this one down here is actually very pertinent to what Callum's doing and I think that's really good. How are the planting initiatives to be coordinated? So how can you ensure that a plant initiative down the road actually coordinates itself? So is there a species coordination? Are you all planting the same species? Are you taking the are you doing species mix? This is London, just to show the impact of trees. There we are. That's an avenue in the embankment. That's a 19, early 1950s planting. That's Photoshop without it. If the benefit of trees ever needs to be demonstrated, I think those photographs actually do it very co coherently. Right tree in the right place. We hear that all the time. What's it mean? Really? What's the understanding? What, what's, what underpins right tree, right place? So, considerations to choose the right tree in the right place. Species diversity, species and climate change. Which species have got the tolerances? All tree species have different levels of tolerances based on their genetic capacity, the place they actually occur naturally. They all have different capacities and different tolerances and different abilities to survive. Rather than just rather lamely saying the right tree, the right truck place, quantify it. So what, what do we mean by right tree, right place? What are we hoping the trees are going to deliver? And then what are the tolerances of the species? And if you've got, uh, I don't think I've got it on this, this one. If you look up the Trees and Design Action Group website, available there free of charge as a download, is a 350 species guide to trees which outlines their tolerances, the environmental conditions they prefer to grow in, their eventual size, their fruit in time. Okay. So that's Trees and Design Action Group. It's a guide to species selection produced by Andrew Hines at Myers Co College. It's the best species selection guide I know of at this moment in time. And I'm sure you'll find it very important. One word of warning, don't try to print it because it comes out the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica for those of you old enough to remember the Encyclopedia Britannica and here's some trees we don't use very often all of whom have real characteristics for urban planting Celtis, Ostraea, Diasporus, Caria and Acer Frimanii. so moving on here's one we don't use at all or very rarely this is now named Stiffnolobium, it was Sephora japonica. These trees were in Dresden at the time of the, at the time where the Allies bombed Dresden flat. They've survived. Dresden are now in the process of putting Sephora all around the inner ring road of Dresden, and they're magnificent, and they're a wonderful urban tree. So how to plant, here we go again. Air, water, space for root development. So in order of priority, a little example, we've, we always speak about watering, but if on a hot summer's day, I offer you a drink of water, you'd probably say, yes, please. If on that same hot summer's day, I put a plastic bag over your head, and then say, do you want a drink of water? I would suggest your priorities might be elsewhere. Well, the trees are no different. If they can't breathe, they can't use the water. So there's more trees killed because of compaction and the fact that the air, the soil cannot hold oxygen. You cannot get gaseous exchange between the soil profile and the air surrounding them. So what happens then, the water becomes secondary because they can't breathe. So just a little thought. Here's some guidance, Trees and Design Action Group again. This is a guide for decision making. It's available on the Trees and Design Action Group website, as is this one. 
So again, they're free downloads. You can, and there is a whole raft of information in there that you might find useful. There's the British Standard again. And tucked away in the corner is a guide that Barcham Trees produced along with that one. They are also free of charge and they're available on the, on the Barcham website. So this one will cost you a fortune, but I've given you a route whereby you might get it surreptitiously, I may I say illegally, but never mind. And then you have these two guides here, which are free of charge downloads from the Tree of Design Action Group website. These two are available on the Barcham Trees website, also free of charge downloads. There are hard copies of those. And if you write into Barcham's office, they'll be very happy to send them to you. So here we are. So why do we get it so wrong? This is a shop from Sweden. Somebody decided that a tree line cycleway would be an advantage. If I did a straw poll now, the likelihood of those trees surviving, I think you would all agree, is fairly remote. Moving on, but it can be got so right. Here's the trees on our left are, I think they're both Stockholm. And Stockholm tree planting is inspirational because they use a structural soil and the whole of that footpath will be a rooting zone for trees. Now I'm not suggesting the Stockholm method would be applicable in Birmingham because it's based on granite. But you can see the achievement. That's what our street trees should look like. That's what we should be aspiring to, in my view. But look what happens. That's funnily enough, that's outside the British Standards Office, which amused me completely, uh, very much. And we look at this. That's management and maintenance. Look at it. I mean, those trees have got absolutely no chance. If you think back to the picture of Aldwych and the plane trees there, 70 year old, 70 year old trees delivering the service we want. I would suggest those trees will be lucky to reach 15 years old after planting and will certainly never deliver the benefits we're looking for. Here's another example. That cage was put on that tree to protect it. Somebody forgot to remove it. Maintenance. And here we are, legacy, supermarket car park. Unfortunately, that reflects what we're actually achieving. You know, and this is why I'm so against numbers, because somewhere numbers have been put to these trees. Oh, uh, that we'll plant 30 trees in that car park. We'll plant 100. We'll plant 1,000 street trees. If the end result is this, then the exercise is pointless. But we can get beyond it. So tree selection. I haven't got time to talk about this book. It's by somebody called Omrik Soman, University of uh, Alnarp. But if anybody would like a copy, I have that available electronically and will be very happy to supply it to your group for sharing. It talks about the natural environment that trees go in and that trees have natural tolerances. And the study was actually going out into looking at the predicted climatic conditions in Sweden in 2050, then going out into nature and finding places in nature that actually replicated as close as possible the conditions that would be found in Sweden, Swedish cities by 2050. And they investigated five areas. There was the Caucasus Mountains, um, in Georgia, it went over to the Tingling Mountains in China, it went across to the Appalachians in America and started to identify species that might be appropriate that probably aren't in nursery production at the moment to actually try to tell, to make the trees that were planted equate to the conditions that they, was, they were going to be growing in. Uh, this, that's just the Barcham guide again, just a close up shop of it. So what should we use when we're looking about the selection of urban trees? Hardiness and health, site adapted species use, function, what do we want the trees to deliver? Succession, you know, we'll plant our avenue of trees 
and then suddenly be faced if they reach the age of those trees in Aldwych. There's no successional planting now. All those trees were planted at the same time. They're all of the same species. When one goes, it's likely that they will go. So suddenly that avenue, which has taken 70 years to create, has gone in one go. And then maintenance. Maintenance is critical. And that's why I'm so delighted to hear the work that Mac's doing because it is long overdue. And then growth. How many trees do you see in the urban environment that are planted that come into leaf, like those ones I showed you in the park, the lime trees, where they come into growth, or they, they grow, they throw out leaves each year, but they don't actually grow. So if our target is ecosystem services, and bearing in mind that more ecosystem services are delivered the larger the tree, we want our trees to grow. We want them to actually accumulate wood each year. And then, of course, we mustn't forget the aesthetics because most people are not really concerned about the ecosystem services. There. They want them to look nice. They want, them, they want their places to feel good. And trees can actually do that. Monitoring review, I think I've said enough about that. There are ways of measuring it. And given the table that Mac has already shown, he's worked well on that. Here's the piece about Melbourne. And I want to just say a few words about London Borough of Islington, some work Tree Economics has been doing there. And I'll go through this really quickly because you've touched upon it already. This idea of mapping. They're the polit political wards within Islington. There's the tree canopy cover for each of those wards. So it's been defined, it's beginning to understand what each of the wards has in terms of tree cover and how they, it begins to show up maybe environmental inequity, how one ward is serviced better than other for trees, how this may match affluence, but interestingly, you can start to use that because you can actually start putting some of the other social deprivation indicators over those particular walls. And it's amazing when you do it, how many associations there are between, shall we say, low educational attainment and low tree cover. And high prescription use and low tree cover. So I'm not, so I'm, here's the, not terribly good, so... We've, done the, we've actually linked it, so we've looked at crime rate, we've looked at average house price, we've looked at a whole series of criteria, but then matched it back to the tree cover. And are, they, are there links between tree cover and all those other indicators? So here's a map of it, and then we've broken down, we've started to do planting mapping. So again, where to plant, the question was asked. So we do started to produce something called opportunity mapping. Where are the potential spaces within, in Islington that could lend themselves to tree planting? Where's the space? And then that mapping where you're looking at different areas, you can start to prioritise. Where are you actually going to achieve the maximum gain by planting in certain space? Where's the greatest need? You can change the criteria, so you may say, okay, that, that area is of greatest need because of the high pollution level, or the proximity to schools, or the proximity to home. but you're beginning to actually provide a strategic plan for building it. This is something which links very well with what Callum was describing. Um, Islington have actually, um, actually prepared or commissioned this um, web map, which actually is a communication tool. So what the, all the information about Islington's urban forests is available on this web map. The web map's available for the public. The public can go in and they can actually look at where they live. What's happening where they live? What's the canopy cover? How does it, re, how does it actually reflect to other areas within Islington? And again, avoided stormwater. This is all available to the public. They can look and see where they live and what the trees are delivering for them and how it compares with other areas within Islington. So what's next? These are the other things we're talking about. Ground proof check, community engagement and produce plans for species diversity. There you go, you'll be pleased to know. I think I've done that just about on time, I'm not sure. 
But thank you. And now if there are any questions, then great. Or do you, you may all want to go out into the sun. So thanks very much for listening. Appreciate you inviting me.